I'm just going fishing now. Tonight, we'd like to introduce our new host, Wayne Walker. A Boise native, Wayne is returning to Idaho after a long and colorful career as an NFL All-Pro linebacker, CBS sports commentator, and sports director for KPIX-TV in San Francisco. We're thrilled to have such a pro on the show. At the University of Idaho, Walker played football for the Vandals with Jerry Kramer. Several years ago, the Vandals retired Walker's jersey, number 53. Like Kramer, Walker went on to a distinguished career in the NFL. He was a five-time All-Pro for the Detroit Lions, stopping running backs dead in their tracks with bruising tackles. As sports director at KPIX, Wayne did more than read the scores. He was a keen analyst, and for fun, he dared viewers to come up with an outrageous feat in his one and only sports challenge. If you know you can beat Wayne, send your name, age, and... Wayne even tried to race a trolley car up one of San Francisco's notoriously steep streets. I got to an early late, and uh, about halfway up, I was really feeling good. And then about three quarters of the way up, I knew I was really in trouble. Running up that hill that day, full speed, was physically one of the toughest things I've ever done. When you think about sports, think about Wayne Walker. It's the last time for that hill. As a seasoned sports commentator for TV and radio, Wayne is a polished broadcaster. Well, as I end this 20-year homestand, I hope I can do just as the Giants did today at the end of their 10-game road trip. That is to say, go out a winner. According to Wayne's contemporaries, he most certainly did. I think if you could think of just one word that described Wayne Walker, he was class. We'll miss you. Enjoyed every bit of the time we spent together. Have a nice time in Idaho. Hi, I'm Wayne Walker, and welcome to Incredible Idaho. It's good to be back home in Idaho and be part of this program. I've watched it over the years, every chance I've had, and I'd like to take this opportunity to thank your retiring host, Jack Hemingway. Tonight, we begin our program by rejoining an Idaho fish and game research team that's been unlocking the mysterious world of one of the most secretive and little understood critters known to man, the Wolverine. In late May, the research team tried to locate a wolverine den with two young, called kits. The objective was to capture the kits, implant them with radio transmitters, and learn about their behavior. But first, the big challenge was to find the wolverine den and locate the kits, a terribly challenging task at best. Jeff Copeland, the research leader, flew over the high peaks of the Stanley Basin to find the mother which already had been implanted with a transmitter, and hopefully find the kits nearby. We found her at Maple, Maple Lakes Basin, uh, but we're headed over to see if the babies aren't with her. Affirmative, the babies aren't with her, and she's in uh, Maple Lakes Basin. By helicopter, Copeland retraced the mother's footprints in the snow and tracked the kits to a rock slide in the seafoam basin. So it appears that, that uh, the family came into here and, and mom left. Uh, so we're just going to try to, we're going to use a um, hearing device to get down in the rocks and see if we can hear anything. Hopefully our disturbance here will cause her to want to move the kits. And when she brings them out, then maybe we can successfully capture them. As it turned out, the crew came up empty-handed. Mother Wolverine never came back. The crew spent hours trying to find the kits by excavating a portion of the boulder field, but it turned out to be a futile exercise. The next day, Copeland and the crew got lucky. They located the mother and the two kits in an open snow field in a high alpine basin. While Copeland's assistant Sparky located the mother from a fixed wing aircraft, Copeland and his helper Beth hovered below them in a helicopter. As soon as they got a firm sighting, the two quickly landed in the snowfield and began the chase. Almost immediately, the little critters fled into the trees and tried to elude capture. Copeland tried to tackle one of them, but the animal leaped out of his grip. They continued the chase. The helicopter hovered over the trees and herded one of the kits back to the snowfield. This time, Copeland made the tackle. Where to go, and as soon as she stopped, 
started to take off and I just dove on it. It's not for missing the first tackle. You, I wasn't gonna miss it there. <laughs> no, no, I had her then. And then she decided to clamp down on me instead of try to get away, and, and that gave me a chance to, to get control over us. Once the female was captured, state veterinarian Dr. Dave Hunter flew in and began surgery to implant the transmitter. Meanwhile, Copeland and his assistant Clint Long raced to find the second kit. Clint immediately found fresh kit tracks leading into a rock slide. And then he heard the savage growl of the young wolverine. Uh, we need a jab stick and uh, capture all and syringe ready to jab this other kit. They jabbed the young male and Clint, a tall lanky guy with long arms, tried to lift the critter out of the rocks. Good job, Clint. Copeland was jubilant. Dr. Hunter quickly started surgery on the second kit to implant the transmitter. Hunter makes the incision for the implants in a slightly different location than usual, just off to the side of the stomach to put less pressure on the wound. Meanwhile, Copeland and Beth take measurements of the animal's height, weight, and teeth, and they draw a blood sample. Once the operation is complete, the crew puts the kits into a holding cage and waits an hour or so for the anesthesia to wear off. Then it's time to release them back in the rock slide. A strong odor of musk will help their mother find the kits when she returns. Come on, big guy. Copeland is thrilled to have both kits implanted with transmitters after two intensive days of expensive overflights and searching. Well, uh, I feel an amazing amount of relief. You know, this was, this was quite an effort put together with a lot of help of a lot of people to try to make this happen. And, and I was getting to the point where I was feeling like this just might not work. Follow-up flights indicated that the mother returned to the kits by the next day. And the family is back together, traveling as a unit in the high peaks of the Cape Horn area. Copeland says the kits will provide a bounty of valuable information for the research project now in its third year. We'll be able to see uh, how long the kits stay with the mother, when, they, when do they separate from the mother and go on on their own, uh, uh, how, do they, how will they continue to associate with each other and with, with the mother, be able to watch them grow into adulthood and establish their own home ranges, disperse from the natal area be able, it'll just be a tremendous lot of information. Even in the early stages, Copeland says the research project has proven that more wolverines exist in the rugged mountains of central Idaho than anyone previously thought. At the present time, he is monitoring 10 animals in an area extending some 3,000 square miles. I don't think there's any question anymore as to whether there is a population or not. Um, uh, they're here. Indeed, a quick view of Copeland's radio tracking map reveals over 800 sightings of 10 to 12 different wolverines. He continues to be baffled by the tremendous distances the animals travel. It's just never ceased to amaze me how far these animals will travel in a short period of time. You know, I, the hallmark of the wolverine is probably uh, its it's almost insatiable need to be on the move. They're constantly traveling. One yearling male, for example, traveled from the Soldier Mountains near Fairfield to the Yankee Fork country near Stanley, a distance of 80 miles through incredibly steep terrain in a couple of days. Then the same animal took off and went 25 miles to the Cape Horn area in a single day. By collecting wolverine scat, the research team has found that wolverines feed on mostly carrion in the winter. They also have a powerful sense of smell, and they'll dig down through six feet of snow to feed on hibernating marmots and other rodents. In the summer, they feed on mostly insects, ground-nesting birds, and vegetation. If they come on to uh, you know, a fawn deer or a calf elk, uh, they'll kill it. If, they, if the opportunity is there, but it's just not something that they, you know, they, they, don't, they don't seem to follow the wintering ungulates, you know, into winter range down onto the elk or deer winter ranges, because they're just not that good at taking down a, you know, like, like a, a mountain lion or, or a bear might be. 
So far then, Copeland knows that wolverines prefer the high peaks of central Idaho as their preferred habitat, even though they cruise from one alpine basin to the next, like we cross the street. Copeland hopes to unlock more mysteries about the wolverine as the project continues. Well, they're certainly, they're arguably a different sort of a beast than, than anything else traveling around out there. You know, it never ceases to amaze me when, I, when I'm flying and I see a set of wolverine tracks crossing a, you know, a nine or 10,000 foot peak in the middle of winter. You know, what in the world is he doing up there? Nothing else is there, you know. Tonight, we soar to new heights with bald eagles, those awe-inspiring birds whose populations are expanding with a vengeance. Now, this is an exceptional story about an endangered species and a rare case in which the much vaunted Endangered Species Act has worked, rescuing America's national symbol from near extinction. Over the last 14 years, bald eagle populations have increased at a rapid pace. Idaho's nesting bald eagle population has skyrocketed from only 12 pairs in 1980 to over 70 pairs this year. That's nearly a six-fold increase. In the seven-state Pacific region, bald eagles have quadrupled from 275 nesting pairs to over 1,065 pairs. That's why state and federal authorities recommend that bald eagles should be downlisted from endangered to threatened. So I think downlisting is warranted. We've met recovery goals in the, in the Pacific Northwest here at least for downlisting. Delisting, however, we need to have some, a little bit better handle on the habitat because if we continue to lose habitat and can't maintain that productivity, they could be relisted as endangered. If and when that occurs, the birds will still have the full protection of the Endangered Species Act, but the move will indicate that bald eagles are no longer in imminent danger of extinction. Soon after bald eagles were protected as an endangered species, authorities banned the use of the deadly pesticide DDT. Although there were other threats, such as people shooting eagles, poisoning them with strychnine, and electrocutions by power lines, experts say the banning of DDT was the single most significant step taken to restore bald eagle populations. DDT caused eagles to produce thin eggshells. As the population expands, new eagle nests seem to be popping up throughout Idaho. On a cool, breezy day, Naderman visited a new bald eagle nest amidst a thick grove of cottonwood trees on the Snake River near Idaho Falls. This is so close, I don't think we've got any place else in the region where we've got two nests this close together. Huh? It's really, it's kind of unusual. When intruders invade a bald eagle nesting territory, the adults flee from the nest, but they don't go far. They circle above, soar in the wind, and utter a delicate, high-pitched, call of distress. Some eagles seem to need the seclusion of thick tree cover or wilderness areas for nesting, but others seem to be streetwise. They don't seem to mind being close to people and civilization. Amazingly enough, a pair of bald eagles has taken up residence next to the 17th green at the Blue Lakes Country Club. The eagle nest sits high up in a cottonwood snag that overlooks the Snake River Canyon. Last year, the nest produced two young that successfully fledged the nest. Golfers often came over to watch. They took really good care of them. You know, nobody bothered them, and it was kind of, it's not, it's very seldom you see an eagle. A lot of people don't ever see them, and uh, it was quite interesting. This year, for some unknown reason, the eaglets did not hatch or survive. Golfers hope they return. Bald eagles have been nesting amongst another group of recreationists in the South Fork of the Snake River Canyon. Boaters of all kinds have been flocking to the South Fork for its idyllic setting and for its world-class trout fishing in particular. 
About 150,000 people visited the canyon during the summer of 1992. But 10 pairs of bald eagles have established nests along the South Fork. It's a key nursery area for bald eagles in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. The Bureau of Land Management is in charge of protecting the eagles and accommodating recreation. It's not always a conflict, but it can be. It's been suggested that direct recreation in the immediate vicinity of the eagle nest during the nesting period has contributed to the failure of one nest that we're aware of. BLM officials have tried to protect the eagles by closing nesting territories to public use and steering boaters to preferred campsites. The agency hopes to avoid restricting boating on the South Fork, but someday it may be necessary. Whatever it takes, Naderman hopes that federal authorities, as well as the public, will work to protect eagle habitat to ensure that these magnificent birds can continue to soar to new heights. You know, I always try to emphasize the importance of looking at the integrity of the territory because you're going to have trees die. You're going to have trees blow over and stuff like that. But if you maintain that integrity, which includes not only the nesting tree, but the foraging areas, the perch trees, and, and the whole works, if you maintain that, the integrity of that, then as one tree falls over whatever, they can move to another tree or, I mean, there's only so much give that the birds have. When you get beyond that, you've lost it. a boy. All right, where'd it go? In these days of troubled youth, gangs, and violence in the schools, it sure is nice to see that some fathers and sons still get together for outdoor activities. Well, I told my wife that if we're catching fish, not to expect us until late, so. <laughs> In honor of Father's Day this month, we followed CUNA residents John Velo and his son Eric to CJ Strike Reservoir for a friendly bass fishing outing. A former Texan, Velo loves to go after smallmouth and largemouth bass for a fun-filled day of fishing. Son Eric, who is 14, is catching up fast after years of tutelage from his pop. Oh, man. On most days, either one of them might catch the first fish or the most fish. Rock. But on this day at CJ Strike, Dad landed the first fish. Smallmouth. What do you know? Eight inches long, about a half pound. Voracious little rascal. Bye-bye. <laughs> I told him you can't, you can't come uh, out here and outfish me, make me look bad. But it wasn't long before Eric caught his first fish of the day. At a boy. <laughs> Way to go, bud. Good job. As the two cast their lines along the shores of CJ Strike, they can't help but to soak in the grandeur of the Snake River Canyon. This country is so lovely. Man, it's rugged. As a fishing fanatic, John Velo got his son into fishing as early as possible when he was just a little tight. As soon as he got to a point where he was really interested in, in uh, fish, I'd, I'd bring home fish and he'd hook them on a, on a line and drag them around in the grass in the backyard. And When Eric was old enough to catch a fish, crappie were the first ones to land in his bag. Now, John and Eric go fishing together all the time, mostly on weekends. It's just a really a, a great opportunity to spend quality time with him and, and, and where I can talk to him about fishing and just uh, try to teach him as best I can of, uh, how to fish. And then it gives us time to talk about his... his uh, problems if he's got any or or funny things that have happened to him and try to talk to him about growing up and this is one way that I hope that I'm giving my kid uh, a lot of time uh, with me so he can he can learn from me and learn from my, hopefully from my example and we have fun together doing something we love to do. It's obvious from Eric's fluid pinpoint casting that he's learned a thing or two from his dad about fishing. 
I don't know, you can just get you can just get away from everything and just have fun and fish and not really worry about anything else. The biggest one I've ever caught in here is about a five pound large mass, but I've I've lost two in here in, in 15 years that I cried over. I mean, that were big, scary, ugly ones. As we close our program tonight, we leave you with the majestic beauty of the Sawtooth Mountain Range. Thanks for being with us.